Hi guys, this video is going to be on William Blake, Songs of Innocence and Experience. And it's going to be looking at the poem Infant Joy. So it's going to be spliced in between my reenactment. Um, enjoy! Let's do a quick overview first. So this is a poem that is spoken as a dialogue, although there are no speech marks used. So the two voices kind of merge, which could be showing kind of like a unity between the mother and the child. And um, this is a lot more joyful than anything we've read thus far, despite my reenactment of it. <laughs> so if you are thinking about this poem, you're thinking about uh, positive social protest themes like freedom and claiming of identity and resisting control and freedom from oppression. So let's talk it through and have a look at how it works. Wah, wah. I have no name. I am but two days old. First two lines. <laughs> I have no name. I am but two days old. So I said this is a joyful poem and it begins with the phrase, I have no name. Now, typically I know that being nameless, especially as a baby, maybe suggests neglect or being unloved. However, this is not the idea that Blake is going for in this poem. The baby is claiming for itself that it is as yet unnamed. And if we think about Blake, he was very much against kind of social institutions and social uh, structures that were restrictive. And if you think about naming, there are lots of connotations to names. Um, one of the most negative connotations linked to names um, links to kind of the time of slavery. When... Um, the person who had been enslaved would have their name stripped away from them and it would be replaced by a name that the owner had given to the slave. So the act of naming, while we accept it in everyday life, you know, nobody really chooses their name unless they change their name, but the actual act of stripping a name away and replacing it is one of oppression. So if we think about um, the fact that this baby has no name, that could actually be a positive um, because they are as yet unshackled within the kind of systematic repression that the act of naming would suggest, like the power of the parents over the child, the, um, the kind of um, pushing of a certain identity onto the baby, the act of claiming that child as a possession, um, the absence of a name suggests freedom from all of this. And the second bit also links up to that. So the fact that the baby is two days old is actually really significant, but to understand why, you need to know a little bit of context. So in the Victorian era, a bit, <laughs> but also way, way back, so like an ancient custom, was that a baby would be christened on the third day after birth. So William Blake, by making the baby two days old, is showing that the baby is as yet untouched by social institutions such as naming, which is a parental kind of conference of authority, plus the name gets written down, so you're kind of embedded into the government system once you have your name with your birth certificate. But also the baby is free from the confines of the church because they haven't been christened yet. So those first two lines, I have no name, I am but two days old, are a real declaration of independence, if you like. What shall I call thee? Most adults in Blake want to control children. They want to um, oppress them, repress them, use them, um, like the chimney sweeps are used by their masters and by the people whose chimneys they clean, uh, children are abandoned, children are misused, um, Children are brainwashed, like in Holy Thursday. They're neglected, like in Experiences Holy Thursday. So it is a real joy <laughs> to, um, 
to see a parent, an authority figure that doesn't repress the child. And that third line where the mother says, what shall I call thee? That is a sign, the question is a sign that she is respecting the opinion of the child. So that is an amazing, um, you know, what an amazing line to have in there. You know, what shall I call thee? Like I was saying before, naming is a very almost political act, can be. And this mother is asking the child. It's a great sign of deference. I happy am. Joy is my name. I happy am. Syntax is wrong. Just like with Yoda. Just baby Yoda. The syntax is completely wrong on that sentence, right? I happy am. What does that mean? Well, if we're thinking that this is a break away from social restrictions, what another thing that restricts us? Language. We're taught to speak. We're taught to speak a language that we think we are in control of. But actually, when you consider it, language is something that is used to shape how we think about things. So one of the big things in feminism is how language is used. Like, you know, you have an actor and an actress. The the main word is the male one, and then the female one is like tacked on at the end. Um, and that happens with a lot of words. You've also got um, the way words are used, you know, so um, we call single men who are getting on in life a bachelor, which has all these kind of positive connotations of like freedom, being fun, uh, having lots of money. And then we call a woman who's getting on in life and isn't yet wed or with someone a spinster, which has connotations of being a bit creepy, uh, being unwanted, being left on the shelf. So it's not really fair. And there is no equivalent for spinster for a male and no equivalent of bachelor for a female. Uh, they're trying to coin them, but nothing obviously is stuck as much as those words, which have those kind of historical um, roots. So language itself can be a great form of control. So by rejecting how speech is meant to happen by muddling up the syntax of that sentence. It's showing that this baby is not controlled by anything, even the restrictions of language. And um, we spoke before about Rousseau, and he said, let me try and get this right, uh, man is born free, yet everywhere he's in chains. I think that's slightly wrong. But the point is, he says, man is born free. This poem is about being born free. He's free of the church, he's free of the government, free of parental control, free of even the restrictions of language, free of, free of being named and claimed. So really, this baby, despite it being terrifying, particularly my version, that a baby is speaking, this is a poem about a an individual who is completely free from the restrictions and oppressions of society. Bell, it equals beautiful. So the naming of this child by her father, who's generally quite an awesome inventor, it shows the value placements that is placed on this child. She is defined by how beautiful she is, not how smart she is. And that is upheld within the story by the fact that she finds her worth not through helping her father invent, not through her reading, but through or her status in the village, but through her relationship with a rich B slash prince. So naming is, as I've said, a really important thing to be thinking about. Um, you know, I, I like my name <laughs> and you get used to your name, but naming is an act of claiming. It's an act of ownership. Now, the baby says, Joy is my name. Joy is a name, but it was not a common Victorian name. So don't think that that is just the baby being like, I'm a little girl, call me Joy. Not happening. 
It's the claiming of an emotion that um, this baby is completely overwhelmed with, this really positive emotion. And it's almost like a rejection of sorrow and hardship and everything like that. And it's also a claiming of what they wish to be called themselves. So that's very, very empowering. Sweet joy before thee. This is a generous wish. The mother wants what is best for the child. So you have a generous figure of authority, a generous parental figure, which as I've said, don't crop up much in Blake. However, there is something else going on here. This is obviously a poem based on dialogue. You've got two speakers, which isn't necessarily apparent when you read the poem because there are no speech marks, but um, video, you can tell. Um, don't know who's more terrifying. One of my best friends, she thinks the mother. One of my other best friends thinks the baby. I'm torn. When she speaks back to the child, it is clear that she is listening to the child because she uses the language the child uses. She reflects that word joy. The baby says, joy is my name, and she says, sweet joy before thee. So when she says this, it shows that she is listening. She's not just speaking at the child and ignoring its wishes, but she is listening to the child and incorporating the baby's wishes into how she treats the child. Again, very rare in Blake. Pretty joy. Sweet joy, but two days old. Sweet joy, I call thee. So these lines are re re reverberate, if you like, with the term joy. And that again, like I said before, shows a parent, a parental figure who is listening to the wishes of the baby. Um, so she says, pretty joy. That's quite childish in itself, right? Pretty joy. Um, or as I said in my video, pretty joy. I don't know why I said it like that. Um, because it's got an exclamation mark, you gotta make it count. But it sounds very childish, right? Which again, doesn't just show you that she's reflecting the child's language back at them. She's speaking in the language of a child, which means that they can actually communicate. She's not speaking above the child's head and trying to show like how clever she is. She's actually speaking in a way that a child might comprehend because it's very childish. Um, sweet joy, but two days old. She reiterates that baby's freedom because she reiterates the idea of it being dissociated from the church. And she also says, sweet joy, I call thee, which is a direct um, kind of granting of the baby's wish to be called joy. So there again, you can see she's a listening figure. Thou dost smile, I sing the while. Sweet joy befall thee. And the ending is just about joy and happiness. And one of the things Blake could be saying is that when you listen and you respond in a respectful way, um, you create happiness for yourself. So this whole second stanza is just full of joyful words, literally joy, obviously, but also smile and singing and sweet and pretty. So it shows that because the mother has listened, there is this sense of empowerment and um, dialogue, proper dialogue, where you actually listen and respond and um, a relationship that is equal. And this is exactly the type of relationship that Blake is trying to model as the perfect relationship between a figure of authority and a figure who is basically under the control of that authority figure. And it contrasts very greatly with other figures of authority, like the the very grey-haired men in Innocence's Holy Thursday, where they're waving wands, which you can kind of equate to kind of like, you know, sticks they might hit the children with. Um, they also take them to St Paul's to try and show them how great adults are and how the children don't really have any power in relation to these rich adults. And they make them walk in two by two, very regimented, treating them almost like they're animals. 
but this poem is very different. Um, the, the parent figure isn't trying to assert her authority on the child. Instead, the child has a voice, has a say, has a, um, a part in constructing their own identity. And partly that comes from the act of naming. So there's no ownership, no oppression. There is just um, a sense of a, a clear identity coming through from the child, not being pushed onto the child. And you also get that sense of freedom um, from all these different kind of social restrictions that Blake was so against. So this poem is, um, is as I said, it is very joyful. Um, the only thing you might um, also think about, <laughs> obviously voice setting structure. Setting, not important, we don't know where this is set. We don't even know if this baby and mother uh, pairing are rich or poor. So we don't know anything about the setting. In terms of structure, the dialogue is interesting. The baby speaks first, which obviously prioritises the baby's voice. Um, but then the baby doesn't speak at all in the second stanza. So you might think that that's a cutting out of a voice but it isn't because the word joy is used so many times in that second stanza that it shows that the baby's wishes and, and voice are coming through in how the mother is kind of responding to the child. So it's still a dialogue. The baby doesn't need to speak again because it has made itself so clear. Um, and the repetition of joy, obviously, is one of the things that shows that, so that's a good structural point. The last thing is voice. Now, obviously, speaking as a baby is weird and very, very alienating. Um, and it is worth thinking about why Blake chose to speak as a baby of two days old who clearly cannot speak. Um, but it is worth thinking that if you use a different voice, you're looking at things from a different perspective. And that can really push people to think of things in a different way. And what does that link to? That links to a push for change and a reassessment of things that are happening in society. Like, you know, you don't think about the naming thing. I, I was once at a, at a class where we read a slave narrative. Um, I was like a, um, a, a teacher in there supporting the main teacher. And everybody was talking about how terrible it is that these slaves were being named. And then we kind of had a discussion about the fact that no one chooses their name and they hadn't thought about it like that because they hadn't associated themselves at all with a slave narrative. And it is obviously not the same, you know, having your actual sense of self and identity taken off you and replaced with a different name that doesn't have anything to do with you is not the same as your parents naming you. But you, it does make you look at it from a different angle. You know, that name that you see is so integral to your own name actually doesn't come from you. And um, when you look at kind of how awful it is of how oppressive naming is in slavery, you can see the differences, but also it makes you think about your own name in a different way and how you, how you make your name your own, things like that. Um, and... That is also linked to this poem because he's chosen a very alienating perspective and that really connects kind of the act of naming to an act of oppression and it does make people reconsider where they stand. So the fact that he's chosen a baby, a different type of narrator, is really alienating and it does make you look at things from a different perspective, which is the point of social protest writing.